Welcome everyone. I'm Donna McKay, the Executive Director of Physicians for Human Rights, PHR. And I'm just so glad to have all of you with us today for what is our ongoing speaker series on issues related to health and human rights implications of the COVID-19 pandemic. We continue to welcome leading national and international voices in health equity, human rights, science, medicine, public health, and we're facilitating and inviting conversation on the many facets and challenges that this pandemic has laid bare, um, always focusing on fact-based solutions um, and why and how science-guided um, and driven approaches through an equity lens is so critical to understanding and addressing uh, the pandemic. Uh, for today's conversation, I'm especially thrilled to welcome a former PHR team member, uh, as well as several, as well as panelists who are all proud alumni of PHR Student Advisory Board. Uh, members of the Student Advisory Board oversee PHR's student program, which provides resources, training, and networks for medical students and other health professionals from all around the world uh, who are interested in promoting and advancing health and human rights. Um, Healthcare workers have been among the world's most trusted sources for information and charged with the responsibility of not only providing care for their patients, but advocating for their patients' right to health. And in the last 15 months, it has come at an enormous cost. So um, let's dive into this conversation. Today, I'm really happy to welcome not just our audience, but our esteemed panelists of experts and advocates from across the healthcare sector our moderator today, Dr. Ali Khan, is a former member of PHR's board of directors and a former student advisory board member. Ali's practicing, gen he's a practicing general internist and executive medical director at Oak Street Health in uh, Chicago. And he's focused primarily on primary care delivery to Medicare and Medicare Medicaid enrollees. He serves as chief policy officer and co-founder of the Illinois Medical Professionals Action Collaborative Team and a founding partner of Civil Health Alliance. Ali, thank you so much again for being with us and for leading us in this conversation today. And I turn it over to you. Donna, thanks so much. It's uh, honestly such a pleasure to be here to really dig into this discussion on how obviously the pandemic has underscored the importance of healthcare workers to really uplift health and human rights. And then I think, think about what our responsibilities are on the front lines and then in other arenas. And I, I have to say, I just, I think there is just no other word other than overjoyed, right, that I can use to describe my, my sentiment with today's panel, uh, which very much feels like a long overdue reunion, like a homecoming in a lot of ways. Uh, this conversation I'm privileged to host is really among a group of friends, uh, colleagues, and compatriots who really centered their lives, and I think careers from the outset, on the pursuit of the right to health and that advancement. And so I think as we'll explore today, that pursuit has really taken this group of health leaders in a variety of different directions across a number of different sectors. I think some more typical to what we kind of traditionally think about the practice of health and human rights and others much more unique. I think one thread though, that as you know, I've followed each of these individuals careers over the past uh, you know, decade has really, that's been central to their work is that, and this is exactly where I'm hoping we'll dive deep today and potentially go off script a little, is really the, the responsibility to advocate for that right to health, right? And I think crucially how the COVID-19 pandemic has either underscored, shifted or, or pivoted your own work in that arena and your, your broader thoughts overall. So, you know, I think this is going to be fun, uh, which is maybe my famous last words, but I'm really privileged to introduce our panelists. Uh, so first off, this is all in alphabetical order. Dr. Justin List, uh, Assistant Vice President of the Office of Ambulatory Care and Population Health at New York City Health and Hospitals, uh, the nation's largest uh, public health care system. He's Chief Quality Officer at Gotham Health, which is the nation's largest federally qualified health center a founding steering committee member for NYC Health and Hospitals Equity and Access Council, and a practicing general internist at Gotham Health's Judson Health Center. From a PHR perspective, he formerly served as chapter president of PHR's legendary Loyola University Chicago student chapter, and is a 2009 honoree with a PHR's Naveen Narayan Student Achievement Award. More critically, he spent three years with me uh, in Connecticut, repleting potassium and doing all sorts of things during residency, so he's had to stick with me for a while. Justin, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Ali. Uh, second, we have uh, Dr. Sarani Lair, uh, faculty at the Institute of Healthcare Improvement and former vice president at the IHI in Boston, a founding partner of both the Civic Health Alliance and founder of Vote Health 2020. She formerly was PHR's National AIDS Student Program Coordinator in the 2000s, the chairwoman of PHR Student Advisory Board, and you know my mentor during my time as a lowly PHR intern back in 2005 when, when she was one of the glamorous staff who seemed to just know have every answer to every question. 
her work really focuses on mobilizing health and healthcare leaders in service of improved health outcomes in a, a more just and equitable society, thinking about capacity building across sectors. Saranya, a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Ali. Katie Peeler, uh, other, or Katie Ratson Peeler, uh, is a practicing pediatric critical care physician at Boston Children's Hospital, an instructor of pediatrics, global health and social medicine, and bioethics, you know, just to add it in, at Harvard Medical School, medical director of Harvard Medical School's legendary asylum clinic, and a PHR medical expert and, and member of the PHR Asylum Network. She is a former member, alongside Saranya me and others, of PHR Student Advisory Board. And if I had a dollar for every time that I have heard from a Harvard Medical School student about her incredible mentorship, even as right now, she when she is doing clinical work in the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit at Boston Children's, I would be able to compete with Aya in terms of funding for other uh, ventures. So Katie, it is a pleasure and thanks for doing this while you are literally sitting on call in a call room in the PICU. Thank you very much, I'm glad to be here. And last but not least, Aya Ram, CEO and co-founder of CityBlock Health. The first tech-driven provider for communities with historically poor access to quality, affordable health care. And incidentally, one of the nation's brightest and most celebrated kind of frontier health systems and sexiest startups, as you know, certified by CNBC, Fast Company, and many other institutions. He formerly served as Chief Transformation Officer at, at the Commonwealth Care Alliance in Massachusetts, where he led a number of unique and really frontier policy initiatives. But you know, I feel like his greatest achievement and accomplishment was really as you know a national student leader with PHR at the Boston University School of Medicine before he came to his senses and realized that there were lots of ways to make a difference in advancing the right to health and potentially repleting potassium was not one of them. Aya, thanks so much for being here. Good to see you. If you'll certify us as one of the sexiest startups, I'll actually believe it, Ali. So I'm, I'm waiting for that. I'm going to hold out. Fair. So let's dive in. I'd love to hear from a round robin perspective, I think. You know, there are a lot of attendees on today's webinar who are coming at us from all different stages of their careers, but I think all of us, you know, are kind of constantly battling with the question of what do we want to do when we grow up, right? So I'd love to know, and we can start with Justin, but, uh, you know, in a round robin fashion, kind of, how would you characterize your journey, be that personal or professional with advancing the right to health? And I think really critically, kind of what moment of realization has, has the COVID-19 pandemic kind of presented to you with respect to that journey, right? Have you had a pivot? Have you doubled down and sort of, what's that process been for you? So Justin, let's start with you, obviously being in the epicenter of the pandemic from you know, the first days. Yeah, thank you for that um, question, Ali. So, you know, answering the first part of your question and just thinking about my trajectory, I think, um, you know, familiar to me when I was a PHR um, student back in medical school, global health really looked like the trajectory at the time. And, and I had a number of very formative experiences, both in global health advocacy and in global health research. Um, and as I went through my training journey, I still continue to cultivate that, even when Ali and I were in residency together. When I went through my health policy training, um, I had a little bit of a pivot as I was exploring options. And, and for me, the public health sector and going into public health was one manifestation where I could translate the advocacy work of global health into a domestic environment. And I really wrestled with, do I want to continue in the global health trajectory? Um, or is there another way to serve in this? And I think, as is the case for many people, um, you know, when I met my partner at the time, the global health trajectory was not necessarily the next best step. And so I looked at ways that I could, at that point in early career, still continue to take all those principles and translate them into a sector that I had less experience in, but was germane to those principles of health as a human right. Um, and that brought me to New York City government where I'm just crossing the six year mark of, of my tenure working in both the public health sector and the public health system sector. To go to your second question, Ali, about, you know, what does health and human rights look like um, in the pandemic? Um, for those of you not familiar with New York City, New York City has immense capital to address a lot of um, systemic issues that's very difficult to do in other cities. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that, but not only are we a progressive city, we, we do have a lot of financial resources um, and sort of a set point of where the conversation is to really move forward. I would say, and you know, I'm, I'm hoping that this is something that will come up today in, in, in various questions and conversations. 
that I've become even more concerned about people who aren't entering the health system. And by that, I mean a right to care doesn't automatically translate into engagement with care. And so this has been on my mind. So, you know, I'm, I'll parse that out as a couple, you know, quick talking points of what I mean by that. So in New York City, as was the case in many other cities, including Houston, the first wave saw many people dying at home. And so we saw undercounting of COVID deaths, and there were many, many structural reasons for this. But it's hard not to think that the potential costs that might be incurred by uninsured or undocumented individuals did not go into the calculus for some of the people. There are a number of health system reasons and messaging from both public health and health systems. But one has to ask that question, did people feel welcome to come and engage with the healthcare system? And so, you know, as a launch point from that um, observation was also, is a right to care necessarily connote a right to culturally responsive care? Just because you create this right to healthcare doesn't mean that healthcare is going to responsibly address your needs. So that also gets into the thread that we saw going on across the country, which is what work do we still have to do and call out in terms of dismantling racism in the healthcare system? So recognizing why so many people have mistrust of the healthcare system goes into this more, what I'm gonna call nuanced um, approach of what's been on my mind about how do we continue to pursue a right to healthcare? And that does not end with granting that right through universal health coverage. That's actually maybe the starting point or at least in parallel in conversation with what does culturally responsive care look like? How do we promote human flourishing? How do we dismantle racism and other isms in our healthcare system so that people engage in that healthcare system? So I'll, I'll turn it over there, but those are some of the initial thoughts that had come to my mind with that prompt, Ali. No, just, I think that's incredibly provocative. And I think this piece around that connection between so much of the work that we think about from a policy perspective that as like, you know, sort of is, is potentially only a door opening, right? And so how do we how do we walk with people? How do we accompany people to go take them through that door? It becomes super crucial. I I mean, this is work that you know City Block is doing in, in spades. So I'm curious, kind of when you I mean, obviously reflecting on your journey, but then how the pandemic has either underscored or, or pivoted this is going to be probably a really interesting reflection for you. Yeah, look, I mean, I think in many ways, um, figuring out how to tell a really complicated story because you and I already both work in in organizations that do something that in many ways is very simple, but within business structures that are very complicated. And so figuring out how we tell this story has been a thing I've thought about a great deal over the last years. And I've, I've boiled it down to actually like fundamentally what I believe we do is trust building, right? These are, these are businesses where our product is trust and building trust with communities of folks who have deep and very deeply warranted mistrust of the healthcare system. Um, the, you know, I think the, um, uh, the, the roots for me in that work go way back is, as you know, Ali, you know, I, I'm the kid of a home birth midwife way back when from Georgia in a community of home birth midwives, all black ladies who, you know, other than my mother really, who help people have babies at home because they were afraid to go to the hospital. And like these roots of fear of the healthcare system as it exists are very deep and very profound. And the pandemic has only exacerbated, right? So I'll just tell a story. I mean, last, last spring in Brooklyn and, you know, Justin, we were, working in parallel in common community, you know, we had EMS, like you call 911, you expect EMS to show up. We had EMS leaving people at home who were, pardon my language, but sick as shit, who needed to go to hospital because that was the thing that we did as a healthcare system in this over, in, in this like hyper reaction, I won't sort of qualify you know, good or bad, but in this hyper reaction to focusing our system on a single endpoint, which was treatment of folks with um, you know, with COVID-like symptoms. And the mistrust that only further fermented in folks who lack trust of itself was really profound. And so, you know, for us as an organization, I think it was in some ways powerful because we were the antidote to that. And so as a, as a business and as a care model, it was a really effective moment of trust building because we still showed up and we added services to meet people where they are. But zooming out from our aperture to us as a healthcare system, I worry that even as we have discovered as a society that there's racism in healthcare, and even if, even as we've discovered as a society that there are disparities, you know, work that many of us in this call have been doing for our whole you know, professional lives, if not before that, 
we've only further exacerbated the rents of mistrust of the system this year, and we have not grappled with that at all as a system thus far. And so I very much agree with Justin that the, the, the work of the next um, uh, either, you know, decade or so in this country is going to be a real reckoning as to what the system represents to people who, uh, who mistrust it and how the, the system you know, either does or does not really sort of reshape itself uh, with an orientation that building trust is the fundamental premise to behavior change, which is all, all of this stuff that we all do is all day, every day. No, I think, I mean, the, the trust motif is one I think that gets, has gained a lot of notoriety, right? From a lot of different, in a lot of different circles. But I think the work of making that real on the ground as you so clearly encapsulate is, is, the, is the real challenge. So Katie, you know, from the vantage point of then, you know, being wholly sort of, you know, neck deep from a ground perspective and you know in in the height of intensive care in the middle of a pandemic obviously i think that piece of trust and trust restoration has a lot of different implications how has that played in obviously in the context of your positioning relative to covid 19 and then how does that you know relative to even sort of the journey that you've been on the past 10 years um i mean the journey I've been in the past 10 years has been a, a little all over the place um, and the fact that I'm a pediatric critical care doctor on the one Join the club. do immigration re research on the other. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I, I, you know, all of us have had very different trajectories in terms of how we've gotten to where we are, kind of what, what, along what Justin was saying. I think we've kind of accommodated um, our careers and, and kind of combined those with our interests and what, what matters most to us and like how we want to accomplish our goals. Um, for me, um, the, the kind of the, the pivot in the pandemic has really been around, like we've all been working towards making health a human right. Uh, again, like along Justin was saying, but it's very different to say that we're gonna grant that right and then actually make it accessible and um, et cetera. And so the thing to me that has shifted during the pandemic is not only has all the things that we know that are terrible about our healthcare system and about the way that we don't give uh, health as a human right, has been known. It's been a bit more illuminated during the pandemic, or at least um, it's been a bit more present in the popular press, I would say. Um, I think, however, there also has been a lot of like lip service paid to things that are going to get better without actual real action. And so to me, the thing about the pandemic that has changed is that I, I think if we're going to go to the next step, there also needs to be um, not just um, acknowledgement of health as a human right and not just um, making sure that we welcome people and give them access, but also I think there's going to be a shift in in um, really looking for like reparations to those who we actually have not given that right to in the past. You know, specifically within like the immigration world, which is more so where I work when I'm not in the ICU. Um, you know, PHR first, and then the AAP and others um, called the family separation process torture, like by the UN definition, and enforced disappearance. You know, there was no mincing of words. It meets all criteria. And so not only are those things bad and should we therefore stop detaining people, but when you, you know, there are there are repercussions for people who inflict damage on others like that. And so I think if we are going to um, grant health as a human right and try to convince people to actually seek care, we need to kind of apologize for our errors in the past, um, provide reparations to, to show that we mean it and that we're not just putting up fancy websites um, and slogans and things like that. And so I think that to me is kind of the next step. And, and that to me, kind of getting back to your original question is how you will gain trust. I think if you, want to, if you want people to trust you, you have to show more with your actions and not just your words. And so um, I know we'll talk about this later in the, um, in the talk, but I think when you work for an organization, um, whatever that organization is, um, you have to push a little bit to get people to actually do stuff as opposed to just putting up banners and logos and mugs and t-shirts and things like that. Yeah, the work of organizational change in that way is, is rarely uh, quick and oftentimes quite complicated. And I think I mean, Katie, how do you think from the from the context of like the many vantage points that you sit at, then what is that what does that concretely look like for you? Um, I, I I like <laughs> I like litigation. I think it's slow and it's messy, <laughs> um, but I, I like holding people accountable. You know, like there's a reason why Physicians to Human Rights 
is a bunch of physicians and a bunch of attorneys and a bunch of public policy people and a bunch of public health people. Like you can't do anything in a silo. And so I think you need kind of a multidisciplinary attack mode. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the reason why all of our immigration, all the detention centers were decarcerated during the pandemic was not because ICE suddenly had a conscience and decided it was nice to let people go. Um, it's because it was litigated and they were forced to decarcerate. And now that that has somewhat ended, the numbers are going up. And so I think that, um, I think, I think in terms of reparations, I think, you know, same with George Floyd, you know, like uh, this was done in the courts. And so I think that there is both a public pressure model and there's also a, a role for the courts. Um, so I would say, and, and in terms of like how you actually provide reparations, what that looks like, I don't know, um, you know, but I um, would be glad to be involved with the process. Oh, we need you there. So that's great. All right, so Ronnie, let's turn to you uh, in the context of thinking about both sort of the journey from over the past decade in terms of how the right to health has been integrated from a career perspective and how COVID's really challenged or, or solidified that. Thanks, Ali. Yeah, and this, this was great. I, um, I'll, I'll try to be brief because I know I'm sure there's lots of, lots of questions and discussions. I think that, and I, I'll definitely want to stay in the present, although I think I'd be remiss to not mention the fact that five days ago was the 40th anniversary of when the CDC first published reports of what is now known as HIV and AIDS. Um, and Physicians for Human Rights has had a lot of work. And, and my work right out of college was actually the first job I had out of college was at PHR. And so much of it was to help health professionals translate their, their sort of clinical expertise into policy. Um, and that thread of sort of the policy driven by those most proximate, those both delivering and receiving care has, has been a thread sort of throughout my career. Um, and I think that it's both about, and it, it's thinking about policy, anyone who's experienced illness, anyone who delivers care understands how much policy impacts the ability to receive and deliver care. And COVID may have put that more acutely, may, you know, made it more acute for a broader set of people. Um, but I think it's important to always question sort of what are the policies and whom do they serve? And most often they're not serving those that are most proximate to the work. For the issue around COVID for me was a fewfold. So one is my mentor, who's the founder of IHI, I think I'm pretty sure he was a board member of Physicians for Human Rights at one point, Dr. Don Berwick. Don Berwick was 100% on this board. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so Don, you know, at some point in the like that early on in the pandemic, they asked Don to write a piece of like, what is the new normal going to look like? What is the new normal going to look like in the middle of this? And um, I, one of the lines that he wrote has just stuck with me ever since and has really influenced a lot of my life in the past year. And he basically, he wrote, fate will not create the new normal, choices will. And I think we all have choices at an individual level. Um, we all have agency. I think we all could probably be a little bit braver um, than we currently are. We individually have choices. Our organizations have choices. Our countries have choices. Our politicians have choices. And so this very much is about the choices that we make. Um, and I'll just sort of phrase two other things. We've talked a lot about trust and I really appreciate how that conversation evolved into trust needs to be earned first and foremost. It needs to be earned and then maintained. Trust is not a given. Um, and in many cases, it's going to take an enormous amount to actually build trust and to earn that trust in communities. And I think, you know, a lot of what I has done, a lot of Ali, what you and your team have done at Oak Street and others, getting proximate, being humble um, is critical in doing that. I think the other piece to me that I've been thinking a lot about lately, and this relates to our sort of civic engagement and civic health work, is actually the extent to which many of us in power, in whatever ways we have power, actually need to seed power. We talk a lot about sharing power, but I think a lot of this is about seeding power. Um, healthcare and others spend a lot of money on lobbying, and yet hesitate about promoting the right to vote um, or hesitate about encouraging communities to, to vote um, and to really encourage voter registration, voter participation. So um, I, I think we need to move from the idea of sharing to seeding power. And I think that's where um, a lot of the next few years 
will take us because I think the next few years are going to be the most consequential in our lifetime as it relates to health to the health of our democracy and also the health of the healthcare workforce. So sorry, let's dig in on that because I'm and I'm curious what the panel thinks as well. But like, I mean, you're obviously working at that direct intersection of healthcare and advocacy, but like so seeding power, right, is, is a pretty provocative thought, right? I, I think and what's a what are the concrete examples that you've seen of that, right? Like how are is that happening today? Are you seeing mobilization of healthcare leaders towards that kind of, you know, seeding both from like a planting standpoint, but seeding also from the context of actually letting go of power, right? Towards that restoration of equity or, you know, <laughs> creation of equity, particularly during COVID, right? Like what changes are you actually seeing that's, that, that gets you excited in that realm? So I think one of the changes that I'm seeing, and again, Ali and I are both sort of part of this civic health um, alliance um, and so the vote health space is actually, and, and Aya and his team at City Block actually helped do this. And I know Oak Street has done it as well. Um, I actually think something as simple as the extent to which you're encouraging voter registration, voter participation in care settings and actually promoting how you um, how you work to, to, um, to engage or to, for civic engagement. So there's a number of systems who I think were quite hesitant about the idea of doing voter registration or voter participation because it seemed partisan or it seemed political. And yet these same places will spend millions of dollars um, to, on lobbying for policies in theory that are about the rights of their patients and their communities and not give communities the direct power to elect officials to support policies that that directly impact their care and their well-being. So that's just a that's one very specific and practical example, I think, of what it means to really think about power and what you do with the power that you have as institutions. But also, you can think about that from individual perspectives as well. But I, I know others probably have a lot of um, thoughts about it as well. So I mean, um, I've got several examples, but I'll stop there. Yeah, and I think I mean, what the beauty of this panel is that we we see the full gamut, right, from sort of the non the non governmental sector you know, obviously governmental sector with Justin, academia from, from what Katie is seeing in health systems, and then obviously the, you know, the private sector from IA. So I'm curious, are, are you all seeing real movement to sort of the, the gauntlet that Saranya just threw down, right? Are, are, are we seeing that seeding of power concretely in, in the spheres in which you work or, or elsewhere? So, so Ali, I, I can hop on that with two concrete examples. Um, so, I'll talk about two different ones and, and I need to be very general about them, but I, I hope they're valuable for the audience. Um, so one of them in terms of seating of power, um, and I'll talk about very general terms, I actually stepped off of something so that someone that better represented in the complexity of identities could. It was a pretty senior leadership opportunity. And um, I thought about, especially after actually reading Rhea Boyd, um, who I know, uh, you know, Katie had mentioned, I, I spoke with a couple of people that I report to and I said, I think the right thing for me to do in this, to practice this thing that I'm really wrestling with and thinking through as a white identified individual is to step off this thing. And there's somebody else who really wants it, I think, and I want to approach them. And, and I did that. And I'm not sharing that story to say like, wow, like I did this thing. I'm sharing that story to the audience today because depending on your background, that might actually be a right thing to do. It might not be the right thing to do, but it might be a right thing to do. And the second story I wanna to give to that that's very concrete is that I was part of the meeting where I was the only remote person, but the most senior person in terms of the org chart. And some colleagues of mine from a different, uh, not part of my organization, but who I knew very well and who had worked with, called me out for not calling out racial microaggression um, during a meeting. And I had a very, very powerful conversation with them offline. And I was able to remedy that after the fact and address it um, because I was called out by a group of people who said, you have a position of power to call this out in a way we didn't feel comfortable. And it was very, very powerful and transformative for me. Um, and so, I'm trying to figure out in my day to day, what would be considered mundane in this world of like the cult of personality. Think about where can I stand up and stand back? Um, and at the same time, still be myself and offer things to these different spaces. But these two examples were very dramatic examples for me that really tested me 
Um, and, I, and, and, and they're in all of our lives. Everyone who's attending, this, there are spaces in your lives where these examples will happen. And so they don't, they don't necessarily have to be dramatic, but they're sort of the essence of trying to figure this out together as communities of like what these principles that everyone's writing about and tweeting about actually mean where you might not be noticed for making those decisions or you might not realize that you're noticed for not making these decisions. Super, super gonna, profound. Others? I'm gonna offer a more maybe cynical view. I, I certainly, Justin, appreciate um, your comments, very much agree with them on a personal level and, and, and share that encouragement for all of us who are gathered here. And also I think the health system has not changed in my opinion one iota this year from a, from a structural perspective, Ali, to sort of the core of the question. I don't think that healthcare as an institution, and like we, we have to recognize that we have, in the same way we talk about other sectors, we have an, you know, we, we have a healthcare industrial complex in this country and that healthcare industrial complex has not listened and has not yet even begun to appreciate that the conversation and the language choices that we are engaging in here are part of their responsibility. And so we see that as, you know, as like the Teflon that has bounced off. And, and I, um, from a business perspective, it gives folks like you and me opportunity because we get to continue to build. But from, a, from an institutional change perspective, um, it is still a fundamentally unchanged construct, even within our profession, right? And I will claim adjacency as the wonderful med school dropout here, but only one only needs to look at the Southern delegation of the AMA's reactions to positions on anti-racism or to look at the you know, perspectives of our hospital institutions on transparency of pricing or to look at the um, like, you know, sort of fundamental rejection of meaningful progress in how we license, which is a physician driven institution, right? And state licensure is a physician driven institution to recognize that the entrenched ways of being that are all about sort of closure to progress are still fundamentally the norm across the country. And so I, I probably am pretty cynical that we haven't actually yet learned the lessons that we need to learn this year as an institution. I see in my friends and colleagues and in the small bubbles that we exist within an awakening, a listening, an engagement that's very different. And I appreciate you know, Justin's comments in that regard. And I, I certainly agree with them. And also I worry that we still live in this sort of micro progressive bubble of healthcare and the world around us has not actually changed. Well, I think this gets, this gets back to Katie's point, right? Of like holding people accountable. We, Justin gave a lot of examples of individuals sort of going through that, that process of seeding power, individuals sort of meeting themselves at the inflection point. Are institutions really doing that, right? When we have countless examples of institutions pushing people back into practice, right? With, with or without sort of the right amount of PPE because there were facility fees to capture, right? Um, we saw, you know, we see these kinds of things all across the country. So I think, you know, Katie, when you think about sort of this aspect of seeding power, what, what does that look like in the context of the institutions that you serve? And sort of, you know, are you seeing concrete change? Um, I, I don't have a ton of comments on the seeding power, um, mainly because I, ha to be honest, I haven't thought a lot about that. I do think in terms of accountability, I'm, I'm also, somewhat cynical, um, like I am. And so I, um, I also, one of the tactics that I tend to like is calling, calling people and myself out in public. Um, and so, you know, I know Saranda read this cause she, um, commented on it when it occurred on Twitter, but you know, we, um, we gathered like various important people, which is not me, I am not important. So I like got the other important people in Boston to agree to write this op-ed, um, to kind of publicly call for um, an equity metric in US News and World Report. And while there's other, other um, organizations that already have them, which is great and they are progressive and wonderful, if we're being honest, like that's the one people care about, that's the poster people put up in their lobbies. Um, and so until um, it's not, it's not like the perfect way of getting at things, but I think I'm not a business person, but I'm very, it's very obvious to me that like healthcare is business. And so if you want to change something, you have to both kind of change people's minds and and for those whose minds aren't going to be changed you have to convince them from like a from like a stature standpoint uh, to change things and so um, um, and so I think when there start to be kind of public and financial repercussions and your your rankings start to fall people will 
change. They may not change for the right reason, honestly, um, but they will make some changes. And so, um, so yeah, I don't know about, I haven't, to be honest, I have not thought about, about the seating power. To me, it's more about making sure that people who make public statements actually um, follow up on them and if they, and then kind of writing, writing it out in public so that they recognize that you saw what they wrote and you're expecting results in the next like three, six, nine months, one year, five years. I'm not, I'm going to be paying attention the whole time. So like, you know, keeping your eye on the ball from an accountability standpoint, right? And making it clear that you're holding it there. Yeah, that, I think especially yeah. When you, if you work within an organization, you know, um, I, I think there are a lot of organizations that are well-meaning and poorly run. There are a lot of organizations that are really well-run and not and not well-meaning. I mean, so there's like a lot of combinations of, of the way various organizations work in this world. And so I think figuring out what your where your organization's faults are, like is it the is it that they um, don't have the right mindset or is it they are poorly run? And so like trying to understand what it is that that organization is as a whole, and then either helping the things that aren't going well be better. Or if the things aren't going well because they have the wrong mindset, then trying to change the minds of those who are at, uh, at top or replacing those who are at the top. So would you say that like the, the stature case, whoa, sorry. Would you say that stature case, the business cases that you cited then are, are the paths to sort of, you know, advocating in a, in a way that's effective without causing issues within your institution? Or is it sort of, you know, issues be damned? No, I, I think it's, I, I think um, I am a firm believer of, um, even though I am, I um, am somewhat cynical, I also am still a firm believer in giving everyone the benefit of the doubt and just assuming that everyone is starting from a good place and maybe they don't have all the information or maybe I don't have all the information, you know, and so never presuming anything about someone. And so if I think an organization is not doing something the right way, I try to learn more about why they're doing what they're doing. Um, and then I think you're just going to get a lot further if you try to come from a place of common understanding. Um, and then if, if, if things aren't right, then starting to call people out. But in a way that's not, you don't, I, I am not one for surprising people. Like I wouldn't have written that op-ed as a surprise to my hospital. It wouldn't have gone very well. It wouldn't have like been effective. Um, you know, I think, um, so I think doing it in collaboration because then people feel like it's the right thing to do. You know, like no one wants to be like the second person to sign on to something, right? Like everyone wants to be the first. And so by by creating this op-ed in a way that allowed everyone to be on it, I actually think it probably raised the conversation at all those various hospitals. Would you say that's a part of your toolkit that you've evolved over time? Yes, I, did, would, not, I would not have been that um, uh, savvy. Right, like, I mean, like 15 years ago, right? We were Ian's like in Chicago, right? Yeah, <laughs> around, years ago, around. I was like running movie nights and writing to my senators, both of things I which I still do, but um, in conjunction with a lot of other stuff. Yeah, I think, I think it's a good question for the group. How, how do you feel like your toolkits have evolved in the context of actually generating that change or pushing forward like meaningful systemic change in the context of the, of, you know, to Aya's point, the bubbles that you're in, right? The institutions that you serve or the groups that you work with outside of in that context, like, you know, as you think about, as you think about the maturation of a, of a advocacy sort of approach, what's changed for you all? What, what stayed, what stayed core? I'm happy to start. I'm very eager to hear all of your perspectives. Um, I guess to me, Ali, and it's actually Katie, it's really interesting to hear your perspective. I, I, in some ways, I think I almost agree from your lens and probably not from mine, which is, which is actually, I think, in some ways, to say the thing, one of the tools that I probably developed in my toolkit is that each of us with our purchase have very different sort of orientations to the world. Had I been still in state government in Massachusetts, or had I been in, um, in a uh, health system or community nonprofit leadership role, it'd be very hard to sort of throw rocks from outside in, but in many ways, I think sort of building of certain institutions enables that. And then I think it's really important to be responsible in using that voice effectively and carefully and, but also doing so from a place of like clear, tight humility. And so I think, you know, I think it's important in all of these settings that we are using our voice in the most effective ways possible, because that is fundamentally what advocacy is, right? Advocacy, I think for all of us who started by letter writing and throwing rocks at the building really hard, we've learned that advocacy, like professional advocacy, is a really powerful thing surrounding us and is a really powerful counterforce. And so figuring out how to work within those systems, but then also to expose those systems when we see them 
is really is really important of itself, right? And so, you know, I mean, to say a thing, we've raised a half a billion dollars of capital that gives me a different ability to say things than I had years ago. And now it's a responsibility, I believe, to say those things, right? And so we have the stability and we have the ability to, to demonstrate that one can build a business while saying, while saying these things, which of itself, I think, for this guy who's never worked for a tax paying entity in my life is an important, I think, lens, right? Like, I mean, I, I think you have to use that responsibility carefully and effectively. And also, I think on the flip side, it means that when we're in spaces like this, we're really intentional about calling ourselves in, right? And so for me, that means recognizing that even though I'm building a company that has an abject like mission and goal around anti-racism, my majority white leadership team is a thing that I talk about with my team on a week over week basis. And so those are failures of themselves in how you think about building spaces, you know, just as it is for a group like this to come together and recognize that we don't have any black or Latinx folks on this call with us. And so like, let's just own all of those spaces that we are in as failures and be really accountable to taking action as leaders to using our voice effectively and carefully accordingly. Yeah, and that, you know, our PHR leadership, I mean, not not from a PHR perspective, just like when we think about our sector from a health and human rights group, from an advocacy perspective, you know, there are certainly numbers of Blacks and Latinx voices. Have they intersected in this space? Not necessarily, right? And what does that mean? And it's a super important point. Out. Other reflections on that journey? I, I would say for me, the thing that I, that I have done more now than I did 10 years ago is I've just, and, and honestly, a lot of it, most of it has been through the aid of PHR teaching me, um, is I've become much better about um, doing targeted research. So understanding what research is going to help a certain person. So like our immigration group recently reached out to a bunch of attorneys and said like, what are the problems you're seeing in detention centers or with your clients or literally anywhere that you feel like you know is true, but you don't have any actual data or evidence. And so what can we do to, to prove that so that you can then bring that to court or bring that to your donors or whatever it is to try to um, have some momentum around changing that. And so I become much more targeted in my research questions um, and having them informed by the people who are going to be useful. And then I've also become much better about um, figuring out how to get the media to pick up whatever it is that we're doing. So uh, in advance, so doing a lot more kind of targeted media outreach before something comes to try to really elevate that snippet of conversation um, in all spheres, um, print media, um, um, video, um, uh, I'm not on Facebook. <laughs> I refuse to be on We'll get you on Twitter. Twitter but, but Twitter. Um, so I've gotten, I, I think to me that those are kind of the big things, research, targeted research, and then how to get the word out for the research. Um, and all of them are all within the eye of um, how to change policy or change law um, as a result of those questions. Again, I think this raises a good question from the audience, right? Which is sort of that in thinking about improving trust building, the question is sort of increasing accessibility to research for individuals for whom it's intended to benefit could play an important role, right? You know, I'm just, does that fit with sort of the, you've obviously named that in terms of like the focus research in the context of your own advocacy and efficacy, right? It does, how does that play when we think about the broader scale from a research standpoint? Um, you mean in terms of like getting the results back to the people who it matters to or involving them in the activity? Yeah. Probably so both. I, yeah, both. Yeah, I'm kind of curious. Yeah. So the other thing that I do, I finally finished is, is an anthropology degree. And so that is very much usually informed by, and I'm, I'm done with my degrees, but that um, that is um, uh, certainly the, the, a big thing in anthropology is, is engaging um, with the community. And, and again, not coming with any particular research question, but having them kind of tell you what matters to them and what what knowledge would be useful to understand. Or also kind of going back to the seating power, if if they don't, if you are not wanted there, then recognizing that you should be not, you should not be there. And so um, uh, that's kind of one thing. And then in terms of getting, making the research accessible, you know, we, um, like when we published our um, report about COVID-19 in the detention centers, like we made, we made sure that it was, um, the executive summary was in Spanish. Like we, we made sure to reach out to all the attorneys. We asked them, I mean, within limits of confidentiality, since we didn't say that, we didn't, we never knew anyone's name. We never knew anything, uh, any contact information about them. Having the attorneys um, give that report to people and then ask them if they had questions to please have them reach out to us or if there are things that they felt were missing or wrong or et cetera. Um, so I think there is kind of 
both. You know, there's engaging those in the actual research question, and then there's kind of asking them what they think of the results when you're done, even if you don't like what they have to say about it. And, and another thing to jump off Katie's point there is, you know, there's a huge movement for citizen science. Um, and one of the biggest things is, you know, as we're seeing with um, people that have passed for long COVID, is body politic, which is one of the largest citizen science efforts that has ever happened. And then there's all of us, which is a, a genetic citizen science project that's affiliated with the NIH. And so I, it, to Katie's point, I think there are these initiatives that are uniquely putting together scientists with people that are directly impacted by conditions. I think another, another piece, and we're hearing this a lot right now in the media is, you know, when it comes to vaccination, it's sort of like, you don't want me in your healthcare system as a patient, you don't want to do research on me, but you want me to get this vaccination. And, and, and advocates in uh, racialized minoritized communities have been saying, you know, you don't want me for certain things. And then all of a sudden you want me for research when it's for a very explicit purpose. And so this gets to, back to sort of the conversation we're having on health as a human right. All of these facets have to be addressed so people trust and feel engaged and feel welcome. And a lot of that is for the reasons that Katie's have said. And a lot of it also is how do we talk about this research? I will say this um, in my offices has been a very popular article that I just put into uh, the chat box in terms of when we're writing up research, not only to design, but the write up. How are we talking about these communities? Um, how do we talk about disparities? How do we call out structural racism? And, and so this primer by, by Dr. Boyd and others is a really, um, I think, a good tool and one that I know stimulate a, a lot of conversations, you know, in the spheres that I'm in. Rhea Boyd is getting a lot of love today for, for good reason. All right, let's pivot a little bit. I'm just curious, I think, in the time that we have left, I'd like to dig in. I think we've we've had a good conversation from a research perspective and from thinking about from an institutional standpoint. I'm curious, sort of thinking about, as we think about this vantage point of we are now sort of in, in the United States, it feels in many ways that the pandemic is coming to an end. Obviously, we have a lot of work to do to achieve a global recovery. I'm curious on, from y'all's vantage point, let's start with UI on like, how does, what, what are the roles that, you know, technology, health innovation, particularly cross-sector innovation, start to play in making this happen? You've, you've touched on this a little bit, but when we think about this, you know, oftentimes these can feel a divorce from human rights efforts. How are, how are we, what is the future path for an interplay where this, we're really, where we're advancing human rights and really, you know, equity more broadly? Um, so there's a couple of lenses through which I think about that, Ali. There's, I think, a sort of a foundational um, anchor to these conversations that sort of get to the research question and comment as well, but that, that recognize that we've both been designed most modern technology for people who have, you know, certain educational attainment levels, who have, you know, who are predominantly white, who are predominantly young, and who are predominantly affluent. And so, when you think about like what we are designing for as a society, we have to recognize that in the same way that we shift the way that we think about research and 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 building sort of accessibility and integration to research, we have to think about sort of technical and product design in the same ways. And so, a lot of our work. Um, and, and a lot of my thinking around this is, is really actually probably less in what is the role of technology and more in what is the role of how we build products that people want to use. And healthcare is fundamentally a product that people want to use. I mean, most modern businesses at this point are all technology businesses. We just don't call them that because we you know like to think of tech companies as this thing over here and other sort of services things as things over there. But we're all tech, we're all technology businesses. All of us interact with technology in our day-to-day -day work, even our friends who work in big health systems, as much as if not more than we interact with people. And so the um, you know the, the quality of those tools that matters a lot and how we design those tools matters a lot. And so for us, a lot of that has centered in um, and actually not just sort of centering in in broader community access, but also in you know, how do you think about trauma-informed design and how do you think about sort of centering in recognition that so much of this work is around trauma. We actually uh, you can share around, I can find it in a minute, I stopped talking, a blog post on how you think about centering in trauma-informed design recently and want to see technology much more broadly sort of moving in that direction. And then I think from there, it becomes entirely about democratizing access, right? So the you know, ultimately, I think that much specifically of healthcare can be delivered virtually and delivered virtually with some very light in-home supports behind it up until you get to true tertiary care and even aspects of tertiary care. 
And so then the question is for whom and in what settings and in what ways, and how do you democratize access to those things? And so for me, building technology for Medicaid is actually very much about equity, right? It's an equity centered approach to how do you provide access to things that I take for granted because I'm running out of a med and I need to go on the one medical app and get it sent to my pharmacy seamlessly. These are things that many of us have the ability to take for granted that the folks that we serve do not. And the tools that have been built for them are clunky and inaccessible. And if you extend that out, you know, even another layer, then you start to think about how do you bring the price point of those services pretty radically down, right? So what does it look like to have integrated primary care available on a cash pay basis to people who are uninsured? I, you know, I'm working in North Carolina currently, which is a really fascinating state in the US, and then you think about global implications too, but where they've not expanded Medicaid and therefore the uninsured population is huge. And I've been actually talking a lot with insurance brokers, I'm sure you have as well, Ali. And the insurance broker base is actually one of the you know, one of the most interesting uninsured segments because they've made a direct trade-off that paying for insurance out of pocket is more expensive than paying for direct primary care. And now you start to think about undocumented folks and you think about sort of broader access points. I think that technology-driven care becomes the way that we bring price significantly down such that this whole crazy insurance schema that we all try and sort of navigate and exist within is forced to start to meet people where they are in a very different way in this country. Other reactions? Justin, this is a place where obviously from like the context of major health system, right? Like these are tools in your armamentarium, but I'm curious sort of what do you all think about this in the context of your day today? Yeah, technology in a public health system is a very, um, there are a lot of layers to this question. And, you know, access to technology has been a very hot topic um, during COVID. Before COVID, you know, there's so many tools that technology can provide when it comes to chronic disease management in particular. But then how do we meet people where they are in terms of their fluency with using these tools, the ability of the healthcare system to teach people how to use these tools, um, to navigate some of the social determinants of health that go all, you know, around to, you know, there's a huge topic during COVID in New York City around access to broadband. Um, you know, all of these create this like interstitial space where all these pieces have to be here to have this conversation. And it, you know, my work interfaces with that. I mean, I really enjoy the conversations on it. This is a problem we haven't solved yet. You know, text messaging for appointments and using my chart and engaging in my chart. You know, New York City Health and Hospitals has one of the highest my chart enrollment rates in the in the country. But enrollment is that a proxy for engagement? Probably not. How do we optimize that across fifty two plus languages? Um, you know, I I appreciate all of Aya's comments because there are very systemic um, rights issues that tie into technology. And I think we develop technology as a society much quicker than we address the implications, um, both at the back end and the front end of those technologies. Um, but, you know, again, you know, as New York City often gets to be, it is a laboratory in the United States of how to get at these issues. And that dichotomy becomes obviously the most <laughs> hardest thing to pull off. Other thoughts here before in, in the last minute? Probably, you know, sort of thinking about the breadth of cross-sector opportunity here and in, in advancing a health equity agenda. Katie looks cynical, so I'm going to live there. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm going to pass on this one. I, um, I, I'm impressed that I got myself onto this Zoom. I'm not very good with technology, but I'm glad that other people are. And so I look to I uh, <laughs> to fix it for us and then for Justin to implement it. I'm impressed that you didn't get paged. That's really the most important thing that's happened this last hour. I probably just cursed it now, but <laughs> let's see what happens. Maybe All a right. black cloud, Ali. Yeah, exactly. I'm total black cloud. That happens. Uh, All right. Any last parting words before we hand it over to Donna? Thank you. Thanks all of you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Donna, Actually, the floor is yours. Well, I wanna pass it back to say thank you. Um, this has been an incredible panel. I don't want it to end. And I know you all have other really critical work you have to do. It's a really, really amazing conversation. And um, thank you for the great moderation and facilitation, Ali. It was a really good um, way to get everyone engaged and to draw out
uh, incredibly valuable insights that each of you have through your various practices and your experiences. And what I appreciated most was the very practical um, ways in which you engage the conversation and some concrete actions that we all can and, and need to take um, in our daily lives and, and particularly in the profession. So um, thank you so much for, for bringing that to light, for calling out um, and uh, the, the actions that are calling out and addressing um, the inequities that we're seeing uh, laid to bear and the structural racism within medicine and the impacts. And um, it was just so chock full of great information today. So thank you. But most of all, thank you for what you're doing on a daily basis for uh, in your medical practices, in your advocacy, in your volunteer work in advancing human rights and equity. And um, you're just incredible role models. And we're so grateful to all of you for the work you do. So thank you. And for our audience members, we will put this out on social media. So please share this um, with people who need to hear these messages and, um, and come back and, and watch additional webinars and part of PHR series, because we are going to invite these folks back to be on future panels too. So thank you all so very, very much.